and be brief. But why don't we jump straight into the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 1. We're going to read eight verses for, the, for, for these three weeks, three, four weeks. We're going to just be camping in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and uh, making sense of it together. So if you've got your Bible, why don't you turn there? If not, it's on the screen behind me. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible, if you're trying to make your way there. Deuteronomy chapter 1, it says this, These are the words that Moses spoke to all the people of Israel while they were in the wilderness east of the Jordan River. They were camped in the Jordan Valley near Saf, between Paran on one side and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dai Zahab on the other. Normally, it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, going by way of Mount Seir. But 40 years after the Israelites left Egypt on the first day of the 11th month, Moses addressed the people of Israel, telling them everything the Lord had commanded them to say. This took place after he had defeated King Sion of the Amorites, who had ruled in Hezbon, and King Og of Bashan, who had ruled in Ashtaroth and Idre. While the Israelites were in the land of Moab, east of the Jordan River, Moses carefully explained the Lord's instructions as follows. When we were at Mount Sinai, the Lord our God said to us, you have stayed at this mountain long enough. It is time to break camp and move on. Go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all the neighboring regions, the Jordan Valley, the hill country, the western foothills, the Negev, and the coastal plain. Go to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon and all the way to the great Euphrates River. Look, I'm giving all this land to you. Go in and occupy it, for it is the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to all their descendants. For time's sake this evening, just to give us a synopsis of what we've just read and, won, and bring us up to speed of what's going on in this text, is we find the Israelite nation uh, at, the, at the juncture where they've been set free from Egypt, set free from 400 years of slavery and bondage and oppression, but they're in between phase. They, they've been set free, but now they're standing on the precipice of the promised land. And a place where they were supposed to walk into a journey that would take from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. It would take 11 days. That journey of moving out of slavery and into the promised land, a journey of 11 days, takes them 40 years. 40 years. 11 days becomes 40 years. And actually, this incredible moment where Moses has led them as almost a transition, transition moment, transition moment, where they're standing on the very edge, looking into the promised land, looking in into the promises of God, looking into their inheritance, their future, what God has got for them. They fall short and they're unable to move forward and, in, and inherit what God has got. This, this incredible tragedy is actually, we tell, goes on and tells us that this whole generation, a whole generation who saw the mighty hand of God in Egypt, who saw God work His mighty, miraculous power in setting them free from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh's uh, oppression, the people who saw all of God's miracles, that whole generation did not enter into the promised land. A journey of 11 days took 40 years. I don't know about you, but as I've read that and as we, it's been stirring in our hearts the last couple of weeks, I, I, I would wonder, maybe you're here tonight and you're like me and you feel often you, you're living on the edge of your potential. The edge of, of, of the things that God's got from you. The edge of the supernatural breaking out. The edge of the impossible happening. The edge of, of breakthrough. And yet it feels like you never seem to quite live in it. The edge of promise, the edge of maybe God's going to do something amazing in my life, but I'm never quite walking into it. This evening, I want to help us understand this reality and help us break camp and move into what God has got for us by just very quickly and briefly this evening giving us just some nuggets to chew on for the week ahead and to stir our faith a little bit. I want to introduce you to something this evening that I, I've, I've called Take the Plunge Faith. So why don't you say that to your neighbor? Why don't you tell them, Take the Plunge now turn to the person you ignored and tell them as well, you too, take the plunge. What I mean by that is I, I really believe, here's a statement that I'd love us to understand, is that it's more important what you are saved into than what you're saved out of. Let me say it in a different way. It's more important what you're saved for than what you're saved from. You see, for this generation, they marveled at what God had saved them from, but they weren't able to inherit what God has saved them for. And I think so often for the tragedy for the church is that the most wild thing about us is the sin that God saved us from, but ever since that moment, we've run out of testimonies. 
We've run out of stories of God's goodness because we've left ourselves on the edge of breakthrough, on the edge of inheritance, on the edge of promise, but never quite walking into it. I want to say it in this way. Faith honors God and God honors faith. The most simplistic way of viewing Christianity is that faith honors God and God honors faith. Here's the amazing thing about faith. The Bible in the book of Romans tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So as the word of God is preached, something supernatural happens in our heart. Faith starts to rise up. So faith comes when we hear the word of God. But there's something even more remarkable. In the book of Hebrews, we are told that, that the, the, the Israelites could not, in, uh, the word of God was of no value for them because they did not mix it with faith. So when I read those, I feel they almost like sound contradictory. It says, faith comes by hearing the word. But another part says, the word can't come to them with any power because they did not mix it with faith. So which one comes first, the word or faith? I'll say both. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the remarkable nature of the kingdom of God that actually he calls us into partnership with him. And he says, actually, I want you to partner with me in faith. You see, in the book of Luke chapter 1, he says the statement, nothing is impossible with God. Please note that the scripture doesn't say nothing is impossible for God. That is true. Nothing is impossible for God. But the scripture, when the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary about the impregnation by the Holy Spirit of Jesus inside her womb, he says, nothing is impossible with God. And with that, it might seem like semantics to you, but I want to tell you that one word changes just a statement of observing God from a distance. Yes, God, it can, it's possible for you, but God says, no, it's, it's possible with me. He invites us into partnership. And faith is the language for you and I to partner with God. And I want to stir our hearts this evening a little bit and give us a little bit of language on how we can partner with God, taking the plunge and inheriting the promises He's got for us. Are you okay for that? Good. I'm excited. So this evening, before we say one more word, let's pray very quickly. Father, I pray in our brief time together this evening, would you awaken our hearts? Would you strip us of all safe, secluded, sanitized living Would you strip us of everything that causes us to settle for second best? And I pray, God, tonight, would you stir our hearts to take the plunge, to trust you, God, where we've never trusted you before. I thank you, Father God, that you have the best ahead of us. And tonight, we choose to look in that direction and take steps towards it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The year was 2009, December, to be exact. And I was living in Durban, and uh, the moment came where I had just finished university, and I'd studied marketing there for three years, but I, all the way through studying, I, I had only this one driving passion. All I wanted to do is, was spend my life preaching the gospel. That's all I wanted to do. I had no other great ambition. I just, the four P's of marketing were, were fun, but I, I just wanted to preach Jesus and be involved in building his local church story. But I didn't know how to go about that. Because I, I thought, do you, do you put out a, a CV on LinkedIn? How, how do I go about this journey? You know, I, I've got a, a marketing degree, but how do I get involved in ministry full time? And this journey, as I was wrestling with it, that God was amazing in the partnering with a local church. At the end of three years, they offered me a job in Durban. The thing that seemed to be my deepest desire, deepest dream, they said, we want you to come and staff and lead the youth here in Durban. And I was like, this is so exciting. And as I was praying about it and so thrilled with this opportunity, I just felt God speak a different word, a word that that demanded a response. Because I started to read, if you're familiar with the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, God speaking to a man, Abraham, and he says to him, Abraham, I want you to leave your father's house and go to the land I will show you. And I read that phrase, and at this stage, I was living at home with mom and dad, and I appropriated that scripture, not just for Abraham, but for me in that moment, rightly or wrongly, but I I felt God speak to me saying, actually, your future is not in the safe passage of just taking the job that's available for you here. I'm going to lead you somewhere where you've never been. And for a 21-year-old who who had come from a a family, a middle-income family in Zimbabwe whose economic resources didn't stretch very far, this decision almost seemed to rally, uh, this this word from God rallied against every bit of sound advice and strategy for my future. This might not seem amazing for you, but for me, this was my journey, and I had to pluck up the courage. I felt God had spoken, but man had opened this door, this opportunity. And at this juncture, I want to remind us, as Mark often does, we serve a God who speaks. He doesn't just open doors. 
So often we feel that we are led because God opened the door, so I have to take this job. No, no, God speaks. The enemy can also open doors. That one's just for free. But I felt at that moment where God spoke, I had to be obedient to it. I went with trembling to the guys who had offered me the job. And I said, listen, you know my desire is to go full-time in ministry. But, but all, and I'm now coming to tell you, I don't want the job here because God has told me that I need to leave home and go somewhere else. And I don't know what that looks like. And I thought they were going to be perplexed. I thought they were going to mock me. I thought they were going to say, what are you doing? This is madness. But they said, you won't, unbel- you won't believe what's just happened. They said, even yesterday, before you even make the appointment to come meet with us, we've received a multiple phone calls from different church leaders offering you a job at their churches across, in different places of the country for next year. And I was, I was, perplexed. I was amazed because I said, God, you've gone before, even before I've obeyed, you've, you've, opened a, you've opened up a way where there was no way. This incredible story, one of those men was a man named Wally Gertzma. For time's sake, this is the abbreviated version. And Wally Gersma, he led Life Changes. They, him and his wife planted Life Changes Church. And uh, they, he came down and we met together the first week of December. And after meeting with him, Wally said to me, actually, Gabe, if you want a job in Cape Town next year, you've got it. And, and I remember thinking, I've got it. I've never been to Cape Town. I've, I've never done this journey before. But long story short was three weeks from meeting this man, I moved down to Cape Town and arrived here in a church called Life Changes that looks a lot different, which was a lot more browner than gray, as you see now, but a church that was full of kindness and warmth and a space where I started to grow as I took a step of faith and moved out of home. Now, that story might not seem huge for me, for you, but for me, it was the start of a journey of saying, God, I trust your voice and not man's opinion. Now, the journey keeps going for life change. I just want to give you, bring you up to speed of where we are as a community. That very same year, life change was a unique community. We had one morning meeting. The, the hall was at a 45 degree angle. The stage was in the corner. Uh, it was a great church, but there was just one meeting. But there was a man named Malcolm Herbert on the, on the right-hand side here who was not in full-time staff, who was, who was a man who's a businessman, but a man who had a passion for the gospel and a passion to raise up young leaders. And he said, actually, I think we need to start an evening meeting, this meeting. That man over there started this evening meeting, and he did it not because there was a huge need. The, 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 the hall wasn't bursting at the seams. There weren't people knocking at the door saying, we need an evening meeting. No, he just saw with eyes of faith that actually I believe God can do something if we step out in faith. Because faith honors God and God honors faith. So he rallied around him some young guys, some young reprobates. There weren't many of us. There were about five or six of us. So it was easy to pick them out. You, you, you. You're on the team. And um, so we were all in. And, uh, but the amazing thing was this, that that evening meeting was, was, it rallied, grew with a whole bunch of young people. And that group of young people that year in 2010, something stirred in them that we said actually that first Good Friday, uh, we said we'd never done a Good Friday or Easter service here at Life Changes. We said we've got a passion to do a Good Friday service. And uh, at that stage, uh, Wally was like, you guys go for it. R- run it. Go, go nuts. You guys can do whatever you want. So we, if you are familiar with this church building, the green room at the back where the kids meet right now is, was where we decided we didn't have enough faith to fill this venue. So we, we put out the word, we're having a Good Friday service. We had it in, that, in the back room there, and we put together a, some, a, a concoction of a service. None of us had ever done this before, but we had a little bit of faith. And we said, actually, God, let's, let's trust what God's going to do. And we were amazed, about 80 to 100 people pitched up for that Good Friday service in a back room of a church, led by a whole bunch of young guys who were very unqualified to do it, who were singing off-key, preaching really interesting theology. But there was faith. I tell that story, maybe, again, there wasn't this huge need, there wasn't this huge drive for the service, but actually the amazing thing was this year, we had our first, we had, we had uh, six Good Friday and Easter services across our campuses, and we had over 1,400 adults at all those Easter services. Now, I, I don't know how you make the leap from one Good Friday service of 80 people to just nine years later, one where we're reaching nearly 1,500 people, but I just want to say that's what faith does. Faith sees opportunities and takes it and responds. You see, this church, the amazing church story here, life changes this amazing story because actually in 2016, we were meeting here at Tableview with an evening meeting and a morning meeting, but God spoke again and actually then with 30 people left this place and went and planted a church in Milnerton. Again, not because there was this huge driving need, but because God spoke, we stepped out in faith. And that Milton congregation has grown and grown. We saw people get baptized this morning and a community has grown there because people stepped out in faith. Last year, 2018, table view in the morning, uh, was, God was doing something. The parking was getting quite large. 
But actually, Mark felt courage to say, actually, it's time for us to step out in faith again. And we moved from one meeting to two morning meetings, an 8.30 and 10.30 meeting. But what was shocking about it was the timing was terrible. The strategy was very poor. It was in winter. You don't do big strategic moves in winter when people are sleeping in and cuddling and watching series. But God had spoken. And when God speaks, it flies in the face of human logic. And actually, God has been faithful. The amazing thing is in 2006, Wally Gersmeyer wrote a letter about the church he dreamt of, which was one morning meeting here in this location at the time. And in that letter, he said, I dream of a church where this car park is full on a Sunday. It had other nuances to that letter, but one of the lenses he had was that this car park would be full. I had the privilege of going to all four of our meetings a few weeks ago, and I drove into the car park of every one of those four meetings, and those car parks weren't just full, they were overflowing. Because we serve a God who honors faith, and faith honors God. I want to say it again. We showed the video, but in 2019, Life Changes is planting another church. We are planting a church in the city. I want to tell you, not a leader, not a a church label, but we are planting a church. Why don't you say that with me? Say, we are planting a church. How cool is that? We are planting a church. And again, this is something not driven by a need, not because we have vast hordes of people who live in the city, but because we've looked again with eyes of faith and said, God, we don't want to be a people who just live on the edge of potential, who live looking in and saying our best days are behind us. But we are people who say, God, we'll keep stepping. And we know that you'll keep providing. Because God honors faith and faith honors God. So this evening, as I land... I want to tell you from this passage what I've really, really learned about take the plunge of faith. Three things very quickly. Number one, take the plunge of faith is not convenient. Take the plunge of faith is not convenient. Right now, God has brought this timing and his unique wisdom that we are planting this church now in October in this time span for us. God's in divine orchestration has worked this to be. The amazing thing is, this is not convenient time for Gabe and Fiona Phillips. We've just had our second child. It's wonderful. Thank you. But two children under the age of three and planting a church doesn't seem like logical sense. It's not convenient. It's not easy having to drive across to town where we live in this suburb. But actually for us, take the plunge faith is slightly unhinged. I want to tell you, we did a series years ago here at Life Change called Are You Crazy? Because faith is slightly crazy. And if it's not slightly crazy, I would question, is it faith? Or has it just become common sense that you've been able to manage? Because here's the understanding I want to bring to us this evening, that either your feelings will affect your faith, or your faith will affect your feelings. You get to choose. Let me say it again. Either your feelings will affect your faith, so actually, I don't feel, it's not the circumstances are right, or your faith will affect your feelings. I want to suggest to you, sir, ma'am, make the decision tonight that your faith will determine your feelings. Your feelings will follow when you step out in faith. Uh, For time's sake, I'll land with this story. We won't get to that point two or three. But there's a story in the book of 1 Kings 17. It's a bizarre story about a lady called the widow of Zarephath. The widow of Zarephath, a great story, 1 Kings 17. Go read it at home for for your own... uh, for your own pleasure. It's just this beautiful story about a woman who has lost her husband. She has one son, and, a, and it's a time of famine, a time of great famine in the land, and it says that there's a huge uh, economic recession, and she is running out of strength and energy, and she says she's only got enough resources left for one more meal. So the story picks up and introduces us to the widow of Zarephath picking up sticks for a fire because she's going home to make and cook that last meal before it says, before her and her son would lie down and die. Quite a macabre story. But then the story takes a turn. It says, the prophet of God at that moment, the man of God, Elijah, walks into that story at that moment. And Elijah walks into that story at that moment. A woman who has lost her husband. A woman who has got one son who's who's fading away fast. Who's in the middle of famine. They've only got enough food for one more meal. And Elijah gets there. And if the prophet of God came in that moment, what would I expect of him? I'd expect him to say, I've arrived with some care packages. I've arrived with some, with some encouraging words. I've arrived with some amazing things I want to encourage you with and feed you and support you. I've, I've, I've set up a GoFundMe page for you guys. 
Elijah doesn't do any of that. Elijah arrives and says this to them. Can you make me a meal? Just, it's like the most unpastoral thing I've ever heard. I'm like, Elijah, Elijah, buddy, let me help you here. But Elijah walks up to a widow at Zarephath who's only got enough resources for one more meal before she'll lie down and die. And he says, can you make me a meal? Because faith is slightly unhinged. And in that moment where society, everyone else was, was settling down, everyone was hoarding towards himself, trying to make plans to make, just make it through. This woman responds saying, I've only got enough food for one more meal. But Elijah says, make me a meal and watch what God will do. And I won't tell you, spoiler alert, this is how the story ends, that that woman responds in faith and makes a meal for, for Elijah. And in faith, she never ever runs out of food again. Her story takes a huge divine opposite, uh, opposite turn compared to the whole rest of society. The widow of Zarephath, a woman that we don't even know her name, but we do know her circumstance. We don't know her name, but we know, do know that death has come and knocked at her door. We know that uh, famine has knocked at the door and, and opened wide for, to her. We don't know her name, but we do know her circumstance. But I, what I love about the story is we meet a woman who does not respond according to her circumstance, but just responds to the word of God. As we land this time tonight, all I want to remind us in this moment is that God is doing something with us as a community. He is moving us forward as a community. We are taking steps of faith. But I want to say that as God moves us forward as a community, this is not just for them or another person. This is for you and me. I pray that you and I don't stand on the edge and watch other people run into inheritance and go, go you. That's good for you. But I would encourage us, as we mine this text together for the next couple of weeks in Deuteronomy chapter 1, would you start to have your heart stirred and say, I'm going to start picking up something called take the plunge faith. It's not convenient. Point two was it's never comfortable. Thirdly, it's never cautious. Practically, if you've never been baptized, take the plunge, literally and metaphorically. Sign up tonight, because actually if you want, sometimes we want revelation from God. If you want revelation from God, here's a good way to get more revelation. Be obedient with what He's already told you. Be obedient with what He's already spoken, because then He can trust you with the more. This evening, as we land, I really pray that God is fueling our hearts as we have worshipped Him, as Mike has brought that word that encouraged our hearts to posture that He is Lord of all, as we've celebrated people partnering with a local church as we've allowed the word of God for a short while just to settle on us and call us out of smallness, call us out of the edge and the peripheral to actually say, I'm going to trust you, Jesus, and break camp and take the plunge. I pray that our hearts won't just be stirred, but we'll be changed. Why don't we stand to our feet in this moment? There's a story in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10, about a man called Blind Bartimaeus. And this incredible story is a man who's been in the same spot for years, the same place for years, who's never known anything of sight. His, his, his vision has been limited to, to the back of his eyelids as he stayed shaking his cup, begging for money, begging for scraps, living on just the, the edge of what he knows for years. The story tells us that the whole crowd was moving by because Jesus was coming, and the crowd were marveling at Jesus. But blind Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is coming. And as he hears Jesus is coming, he throws religious uh, decorum, he throws uh, the way that people should respond out of the way, and uh, with a desperation, he starts to yell out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I want to tell you, when I read that scripture, it's prefaced by it with, he shouted, and it's ended with an exclamation mark. This was not some polite response. This was not some religious Christianity, Christianical, well, that's not even a word. But this was not even some normal response of how we're supposed to do it. Can I tell you, sir, ma'am, with the, with the very raw ability of this evening tonight, we were made to be barbarians. We are made to be people who see the impossible. We are made to be people who see the invisible. Faith is seeing that which is not being seen in natural sight. That is what you and I were made for. 
Why would we settle for anything less? Today I want to ask you, would there become a desperation start to stir in your heart where you would not let Jesus just walk on by your story and let other people experience him without you apprehending Jesus and saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's the amazing thing. That story ends when Jesus calls him out and says, blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? It almost, again, such an unpastoral question. He's blind, for goodness sake, Jesus. Jesus, give him some bucks. Do you say, no, I've, I've, again, let me, I can help you with a, a business plan and get you out of the street corner. Jesus doesn't suggest any of that. Jesus says, what can I do for you? Why? Because Jesus doesn't meet us at our point of need. He meets us at our point of faith. That's good. Let that just settle for a second. Jesus meets us not, if you have huge needs, that he's compassionate, he is kind. But today I want to tell you the people who walk into the future and the inheritance, the promise he's got are people who have faith and say, Jesus, I want to see. Tonight, if there's desperation stirring your heart for more of God, and actually I want to take the plunge of faith. I don't even know what that looks like, but God, I want to shift from where I am to where you'd have me to be. Let's lift our hands this evening together as a bunch of barbarians saying, God, would you stir our hearts afresh? Father, I pray right now, open our eyes that we could see. Open our eyes to see that there are more for us than those that are against us. Open our eyes to see that the opposition is not there to disqualify us, but to qualify us into the more. I thank you, God. Give us eyes to see that the giants in the land will not cause us to fall back, cause us to falter. But actually, God, would we see the land of milk and honey? Would we see the promises of God? And Father, I pray right now in every single heart, whether it's for the first time or for the thousandth time, I pray right now, Jesus, would faith arise in your saints. Would faith arise? We are people of faith because faith honors God and God honors faith. So, Father, open our eyes because we were people who are going to take the plunge and trust you for the impossible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.